Thanks for listening to I Catch Killers and subscribing to True Crime Australia. As well as exclusive first access to episodes a week before anyone else, your subscription means you can access bonus material at icatchkillers.com.au. The public has a long-held fascination with detectives. Detectives see a side of life the average person is never exposed to. In this podcast series, I Catch Killers with Gary Jubelin, I'll be interviewing a whole range of people you come across as a detective, including police, bad guys and victims. I spent 34 years as a cop. For 25 of those years, I was catching killers. That's what I did for a living. I was a homicide detective. I'm no longer just interviewing bad guys. Instead, I'm taking the public into the world in which I operated. The guests I selected have amazing stories from all sides of the law. The interviews are raw and honest, just like the world they inhabited. No one who steps into the world of crime comes out unchanged. Join me now while I take you into this world. This episode of I Catch Killers contains conversations that some listeners may find confronting or triggering. Discretion is advised. Welcome back to part two of criminal psychologist Tim Watson Munro on I Catch Killers. Tim is going to continue on giving us an insight into the mind of a criminal. This episode will discuss Tim's dealing with mass murderer Julian Knight, corporate fraudster Alan Bond, Melbourne gangster Alphonse Gangatano, and bikey Mick Howie. Also, how he dealt with his own demons, managing an out of control cocaine habit. Welcome back, Tim. Thank you, Gary. Well, the first episode was extremely interesting and uh, Colour, colourful, colour, colourful, and uh, yeah, it's a side of the world that most people don't get to see. Absolutely. Well, I pulled my punches. It was actually much worse than that. But yeah. uh, you know, we've got to bear in mind our audience. A- exactly. And I, I think I made the comment to you during the break that uh, as a homicide detective, I, I thought I'd seen a lot, but uh, you take it to a whole new level. Um, we'll, we'll get that for the next book. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that can yeah. be the grab. Um, one of your clients, Julian Knight. Yeah. Um, now, Julian Knight, the name probably sounds familiar to uh, people. Uh, he killed seven people and injured 19 others in a shooting spree in Melbourne in 1987. Um, can you explain your dealings with him and the, the full circumstances of um, what you found in, in your dealings with him? Um, I was retained by the defence and uh, as was my psychiatrist partner, David Syme, and they wanted us to do a psychiatric and psychological workup of night uh, to look at potential options. Was he mad? Was he bad? Was he a bit of both? Um, and so I saw night at Pentridge probably within 10 days of Hoddle Street occurring. I didn't know what to expect because the crime was the worst mass murder in Australia beyond the massacre of the Koori people during colonisation times. Nobody had killed more people at once than Knight. And I was expecting, you know, a green-headed monster. What I, in fact, found was a 19-year-old kid, bewildered. Uh, He was in the hospital at Pentridge Jail, the old Pentridge Jail, and he had a military background. So rather than being hostile and aggressive, because I anticipated that as well, Um, He was very polite, almost obsequious in terms of his dealings with him. I spent a year having discussions with him before the final report was done. Mm. And during that time, there was a consensus of opinion that he he was bad, he wasn't mad, he knew what he was doing. Um, People had explored whether he'd had some sort of dissociative reaction where he was temporarily insane, but... You know, he, he managed to shoot down the police helicopter, the, new, the Victorian police helicopter. Mm. Uh, it didn't crash, but it hit the tank and he, they had to come down quickly. He was a marksman and uh, he'd been to Duntroon for about a year. He was bullied. Mm. Uh, Duntroon was notorious for this type of behaviour and he was seen as a kid from the wrong side of the tracks. He didn't go to Melbourne Grammar. Um, his dad, in fact, was a, a captain in the army. And so consequently, he was ostracised almost from day one. He reacted to that bullying and eventually it spilt over. He stabbed a mess sergeant at the private bin nightclub in Canberra. But you need to understand the mess sergeant, he was 19, the mess sergeant was probably 20. Because when you go to Duntroon, you get rank as you go through the course. So he was being pushed around by a guy who was 12 months older than him. Mm. And it culminated in him stabbing this guy. Uh, some dispute over a girlfriend, as I recall, uh, some jealousy. And uh, he was then 
put on leave. So the striking thing about him was they, if that had happened in any other context, you'd have him seen straight away by a shrink. It, yeah. it didn't happen. He had some wounds from the stabbing. He convalesced in a hospital. And then through his father, it was agreed to release him into the community on like army bail. Right. He was going to face a, a court-martial. And so he went back to Melbourne. So the stabbing offence all occurred within the military and was dealt within within the military or was there criminal charges that... Uh... He was facing criminal charges. Right, okay. But I probably in the community, but it never got yeah. to that point because okay. of what then subsequently happened, yeah. which was he went back to Melbourne, he was totally disenfranchised, he'd lost his friends um, and he went back to the parents' home in Ramsden Street, Clifton Hill. And his mother had converted his bedroom into a bed sitter, so he didn't even have his bedroom left. Right. Um, on the night of Hoddle Street, he went down to a local hotel. He got quite intoxicated. Uh, when he was breathalyzed, some hours after the event, he blew 0.07. Right. Okay. So, you know, yeah. he, was, he was reasonably intoxicated, which tells you what a marksman he was. And the one thing he excelled at uh, at Duntroon was sniper shooting. Right. You know, okay. so he was handy with a gun. The guns that he used were given to him by his family and this case was a turning point for me in terms of really advocating better gun control mm. in the community. He had three high powerful weapons and um, he had lots of ammunition and he snuck out of the house, went down Ramson Street, crossed Hoddle Street. There's a big park there and he set up on a grassy knoll and he started shooting. Mm. So... That was what he did. Uh, he stayed in jail all that time. And my involvement initially was to do a psychological workup on him. It was decided that he was bad, not mad. It didn't go to trial. He right. pleaded guilty, which I think was merciful for the victims. Yeah. Uh, it would have been terrible for them to relive it. Uh, harrowing stuff. And it was a case, I think, that sort of it launched my career because it was such a high-profile case. It was extremely high-profile at the time. But it was also the beginning of my demise, I think, because I didn't recognise it at the time. Uh, I was over-enthusiastic. I mean, it was 87, so I was 34 years old, still right. comparatively young. And um, I wanted to see all the photographs. I really wanted to get into this, knowing the importance of the case. Right. And I developed symptoms of uh, vicarious post-traumatic stress disorder out of that case. Right. And I buried them for a long time. It erupted later and we'll discuss that. So he ended up pleading um, and interestingly enough, I mean, you've kicked around the court for decades too. I mean, generally you steal a colour TV or a car, you'll at least get an hour or two, certainly back then in yeah. the 80s on the, the plea, the sentence hearing, yeah. you'll call evidence. Um, his whole thing was over in less than a day. The largest yeah. mass murder in a, uh, you know modern yeah. Victorian history. Uh, a lot of victims, and they just wanted it out of the way. He put his hand up, yep. he was sentenced. He was uh, sentenced to a life term with a minimum of 27 years, which mm. back then was considered to be a very heavy tariff, you know. Yeah. Um, that, had ex that expired in 2000 and... Uh, well, he's now done 33 years. Yeah. yeah. So he's been in jail a long time. Um, he hasn't made any friends along the way. Um, he's been very vocal... He's been subject to additional punishment beyond his confinement. So he's a highly intelligent guy, you know, IQ in the top 2%. When you, when you sat down with him to assess him, how, how much time did you spend one-on-one -on -one with him and talking to him? Oh, look, over the period of a year, I don't know, I saw him a lot in the beginning and then monthly, probably 15 to 20 hours in that period of a year. Yeah. A lot of time. It is a lot of time sitting mm. sitting opposite uh, someone. Yeah, and particularly when you're dealing with that sort of subject matter yeah. and going through his history and uh, his attitude to his offending. Back then he didn't uh, express any remorse at all. Mm. Um, a few years ago he did. He wanted to see me and we had a chat about it and he said, I'm really sorry for what I've done. It won't make any difference to when he gets out in my view because... What they've done is the Victorian government uh, passed special legislation, uh, which I guess could be loosely described as the Julian Knight Act, yeah. uh, which says that he can't be considered for release to parole 
until he's too old or physically infirm to present a threat to the community. Yeah, yeah. So you've got a guy that's now in his 50s, highly intelligent, wants to study, can't, and uh, there's no light on the horizon for him at all. Right. And that's why he's become a vexatious litigant because he's using every opportunity he can to keep keep his memory alive, I think. When uh, you sat down and spoke with him and you said that he showed no remorse, um, mm. could he justify it in his own mind, his actions? I, I'm, ju- I'm just curious. Like I, I've sat opposite uh, killers and uh, I'm always interested in killing on that scale. Not directly. It's a, it's a great question. He never directly said, I'm sorry I did this and this is what happened. Mm. Um, it was, a, I think, it was just an explosion. You know, he, he'd had his heart set on being a career soldier, an officer and a gentleman. Yeah. Even as a young child, he'd play with toy soldiers uh, in the family living room. He changed school so that he could do army cadets at school. Right. So uh, he, he certainly had that fixation. Oh, he's ab- absolutely that. fixated. Oh. And um, he was pretty right-wing in his leanings. He, he enrolled at La Trobe University but discontinued because he thought the place was full of commos. Mm. And then he applied for Duntroon. He was accepted. And his father cautioned him. He said, I think you should wait a year and mature somewhat, mm. uh, which he declined to do. Now, if he'd waited that year, who knows? He might yeah. have got through the system uh, unscathed, but it didn't happen. So at the time of committing the offence, do you think it was a culmination of uh, the trouble he got himself in with the, the stabbing? Um, obviously his career in the army was not going to uh, play out the way that he envisaged and then uh, coming home and he's no room and all that. Is it all? Is this a build-up that you yeah, see? Yeah, it, it's definitely a build-up. But I would suggest and I did suggest from memory that the the private bin nightclub incident clearly reflected he was going off the rails then. Yeah. And because it wasn't picked up and treated then, it then got much worse. It was interesting. It was a Sunday, the the offence, and what happened that day, on that day, it was a Sunday, he'd attended his grandmother's birthday party. Right. He'd been all right, apparently. And in the course of driving his Holden Tirana home, the clutch seized up. Yeah. And he kangaroo hop the car all the way home. Now, it probably represented to him, metaphorically, another failure. Everything in life. Everything in life is bad. Nothing's worked. Not even my car works. Yeah. And then he went down to the hotel. He drank a bit. He was a bit sort of uh, aggressive. Yeah. And the publican threw him out. And it was at that point he went home. So there was, you know, that sliding door moment. If there'd been people at the pub that he'd had a drink with, mm. if he hadn't drunk so much, if the car hadn't broken down, all these what ifs. But the the definite is that it happened. Mm. And the planning that went, did he know who he was going to target when he went oh, to no, that Oh, no, it was location? totally random. That was the frightening thing. So he's just walking out this angry man or this... With three high-powered weapons yeah. and lots of rounds and um, he just pulled the trigger mm. and it went from there. In the second book, The Shrink in the Clink, there's a, an outline of his thought processes, which he gave to yeah. me, and he was happy for me to talk about it, um, where he, he goes into combat mode. And uh, I guess police experience this too. When yeah. you're in a highly stressful situation, your training takes over. You don't think yeah. much about what you're doing beyond surviving. And um, he claimed he was in combat mode, but... Uh, he talks about killing people and running up and down railway tracks, hiding. Eventually he had one bullet for himself, but yeah. he surrendered meekly to the police. Right. He said it's better to die on your feet than live on your knees. But right. guess what? He couldn't, uh, couldn't live up to that. Mm. The, he couldn't live up to it. It's certainly, uh, certainly, and I understand why you say about uh, firearms and uh, the, the concern of having someone like that, if he didn't have access to the firearms, who knows, it, it might have played out, he might have got into a punch-up at the pub. But That's it. It's that rage that people can go into, yeah. and I've seen it, um, where judgment goes out the window, yeah. fueled by alcohol, poor impulse control, mm. but he knew enough to get to the pub, to his yeah. house, to get the guns, yeah. to load up and go, you know, probably 200 metres down the road before he started. Yeah. So he wasn't that um, incapacitated by alcohol and rage that he didn't know what he was doing. On a personal <coughs> level, does it feel, leave you feeling drained when you've got to spend so much time uh, with a person like that? 
Well, at the time I was much younger and I was pretty pumped up over the case. It was a big case. Yeah. And not not from any voyeuristic point of view. I just wanted to do the best job I could. Yeah. And so I became over-involved with it. I've learnt to establish boundaries, you know, yeah. in my old age. Uh, these days I don't know that I'd even take on a case like night yeah. because there's always a price to be paid emotionally. And I do find, you know, some of the cases I do, they're very draining. Yeah. So I cherry-pick them now. I've heard yeah, that well, right. That's where uh, <coughs> a bit of experience and uh, mm. that you can. Then. But uh, I, I suppose you said you were 34 at the time and uh, it's an interesting time in your life because you've, you've got the skills, you've got the energy, but you have, haven't proved yourself fully. And uh, and you don't have the experience to deal with what you're confronted with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, my peers at the time, some were working in the law, you know, some were clerks at the land titles office. Yeah. They had normal lives and here I am really at a young age thrown into the, the worst crime in Australian yeah. history at the time beyond Ned Kelly and all those historical yeah. figures and, you know, I was retained obviously because of my skill but perhaps I shouldn't have been retained because I lacked the, immature, the maturity to deal with it. Oh, it's an inter- yeah. interesting way to look at it and reflecting on it. I'm interested to also talk about, and I, I know that you also had dealings with victims uh, from the Martin Bryant uh, or people that were uh, uh, down in uh, Tasmania when Martin Bryant uh, uh, committed the mass uh, shooting. Yep. What sort of impact does that have on people, being confronted like that? It's life-changing. Life is never the same. And it was a husband and wife uh, in their 60s from memory back then, and they'd gone to uh, Port... Arthur, just as tourists, yeah. and they were in the Broken Arrow Cafe. I've, I've seen the crime scene photos of there of <coughs> went down and, and took them and, uh, yeah. Horrendous. And they were in the queue and I think Bryant was behind them and they were chatting to him, no indication of what was about to unfold. And when he started shooting, they dived under the tables. There were these thick log tables and it's the stuff of nightmares. They could see him walking up and down picking people off Mm. and then he spied them and this guy leapt out and he put his arm up to protect himself and his wife. The bullet went through his arm, hanging by a thread, but somehow they managed to escape and survive. Yeah. So when I saw him, he had external fixtures to repair the wound. He was having bone grafts. Um, He had unbridled post-traumatic stress disorder as did all the survivors and, of course, the first responders. Mm. And no doubt you've seen this too. Yeah. You know, we all get vicarious PTSD, not because we've directly witnessed what's gone on, mm. but we have witnessed the aftermath and we have to deal with it and trawl through it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it can be very confronting at times. Yeah. It was interesting getting back tonight just for a moment. Um, a number of the survivors of Hoddle Street were going to be referred to me right. for treatment. And I said to the lawyers, because uh, they were going for victims' compensation, I said, I think I've got a conflict of interest here. Mm. You may not know, but Knight is my client. And he said, they all know that. That's why they want to speak to you and you're cleared to do it. Uh, so that's very interesting. It's very interesting. And, and they really wanted to get inside his head, I think, to understand what had gone on. Now, I couldn't say too much because it's obviously a matter of privilege, but um, it all came out ultimately in the sentence hearing in terms of uh, When you explain it that way, I I do understand it because you're probably the the closest person to understand what was going through his Mm. mind at the time. And if you're a victim or a witness to it, it would give you an insight or help you process it, I would imagine. Some insights. Look, I still don't fully comprehend it, to be Mm. honest. You know, all these years on... um, he was angry, he was this, he was that, but there were obviously underlying drivers because we all get angry and disappointed in yeah. life, but we don't go out and shoot dead seven people and wound 19 others and take down a police helicopter. Yeah. You know, we don't yeah. do that. Thank goodness. Um, moving on to another um, uh, high-profile uh, person, but uh, certainly a completely different nature, but um, Alan Bond, um, probably one of the highest-profile people in the country, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, widely loved. He was like a national hero with the uh, America's Cup and his involvement in that. Um, and then uh, so he hit the heights and then uh, hit the lows. And uh, He sure did. Um, he was a very interesting guy, Alan, and I liked him. Yeah. Um, 
He was a good player too. Uh, so, you know, we used to fly over from Melbourne. It was back in the days of ANSET. Um, so, could, could, sorry, could you just explain uh, how you became engaged? Uh, same it? deal. Um, I was retained by team. the defence lawyers. Okay. And um, They'd fly you over the WA? I was, yeah, they did. But I was initially retained because they said they couldn't get coherent instructions from him. Right. And this has been publicised for decades since that he had problems with his memory. And this has been after he was charged? After he was charged. Yeah, yeah. And I saw him, we did some testing, and there was no doubt he had some memory impairment. Yeah. And the basis for that was that he'd had heart surgery, uh, he'd had a valve replaced in the heart, and something like 60% of people who have this surgery, because they can't get a perfect seal on the heart-lung machine, mm. they get microemboli, little bubbles, that get into the blood that can cause diffuse brain damage. It resolves generally. Right. It takes six to 12 months to resolve. Um, so I'd seen him after the surgery and he was clearly having problems with recall. Everyone thought this was a rot, but uh, mm. listeners, it wasn't. It was genuine. And he, um, he was assessed by neurologists and neuropsychologists. There was no argument about it. And uh, so I did the report and then... He went to trial uh, and in the interim I would go to Perth and he would see me in Sid- uh, sorry Melbourne yeah. on a regular occasion, Sydney sometimes. And when I went to Perth, we would fly over with the old ANSET before it crashed and burned. It was yeah. always seat 1A on a Sunday afternoon yeah. and uh, it was the closest I've ever come to Dallas, you know. It was, it yeah. was just a great... Oh, he was that big a figure at the time, wasn't he? Yeah. Be picked up at the airport, limo to the hotel, all imagine. that sort of stuff. I mean, these days I wouldn't do that either. Yeah. I'd get a taxi because, you, you know, you, you can get too close to people. And was that part of his uh, pitch to you? What, what do you think that was about or is that just how he lived his <clears throat> life? That's how he lived his life. Yeah. I, I don't think that he was trying to manipulate in yeah. any way. Um, it was just part of his life. But, you know, he had a lot of things going on in his life. Yeah. Uh, he was charged with uh, embezzling about a billion dollars yeah. and this is in the 90s, so multiply that by yeah. three or four times yeah. and it's a large it's sum of money. It's a country's... Uh, but it eventually went to trial and he was found guilty and there was then another trial over Bell Resources. He was found guilty on that and um, I then went to see him out at uh, one of the prisons. He was in a prison farm. And this is a great story because uh, there was one time I arrived and the prison officer said, look, he can't see at the moment, he's running finance classes. <laughs> I said, what? And he said, yeah, he's up in the up in the demountable up there. He's, he's teaching the crooks how to apply for bank loans and uh, investing. Yeah. And I, I sort of nodded and winked and I said, you reckon I could sit in on this? And he said, sure, you can. So <laughs> I went to the back of the class and there he was. There was a whiteboard yeah. and he was in his prison greens and these guys were taking down notes. He was trying That's to classic. be constructed. Yes, it's unbelievable. Um, I came to know him reasonably well during that time and uh, I asked him at some point a question I'd wanted to ask even as a kid where um, I remember my father saying, this was when he did the Yanchep deal, which was his first big deal. Yeah. He sold paint, uh, sorry, sand-painted green to the Japanese on spec, and he made a fortune, subdivided it all. Before that, he'd been a sign right of a real estate that, that agency. That was a, a property development. Property it, development. Yeah. Uh, over in WA? Yeah, Yanchep, yeah. uh, north, north of Perth. Of, yeah. And uh, it, the whole thing was a dud. You know, the land was worthless, really. Yeah. Uh, but just to trick up the posters and the brochures. On the, the edge it, of a desert. <laughs> it was painted green. Yeah. And these people from other countries bought the land. He made a million dollars, plus, plus, plus. He was obviously going somewhere. I can remember my father saying, this guy's somebody to watch. Mm. And, of course, there was America's Cup. Yep. And I can who, who can not remember that particular the day. When we, we won the America's Cup and Bob Hawke saying, if you don't give your workers a day off, you're a mug. Dressed in his um, yeah, sports so, yeah, yeah, it was a great suit. Yeah. Unbelievable. So this was years before Bond was referred to me, but uh, I eventually got my chance and uh, some way into this process, he, he saw me on and off for about three or four years. I said, you know, Alan, you made a fortune in your 20s. Yeah. Why didn't you just pull up stumps and live the life? Which is what a lot of people would do. Mm. 
and he said, Tim, you don't understand. It, it's not about the money. I love doing deals. And that was it. His adrenaline, his motivator, his driver was all about doing deals. That, that was and the thing. so on, yeah. And what was it about his personality uh, that you, you found that drove him for that? Um, oh, very task-focused, um, uh, seriously an over, overachiever. Yeah. Um, and I think underlying that he, he obviously wanted global recognition, which he received for a mm. while. Mm. And that was the driver behind the, the America's Cup. He saw it as an amazing marketing opportunity to get deals done in the US and elsewhere. And he did big deals. I mean, he bought a brewery in the US. He bought the Chilean phone company. Yeah. He, uh, he bought an entire village in the UK. There was a, about status. Was it bought some artwork as well. There was yeah. Well, that got him into trouble. He yeah. bought a Van Gogh through yeah. the company, and then it appreciated dramatically. Yeah. Uh, between the lease commencing and ending, and he then sold it as a private citizen, Alan Bond, and profited the difference. Right. Whereas it should have been distributed to the uh, the shareholders. Right. Uh, sure, he wanted the status. Yeah. Um, and he was ruthless. A lot of people would say he was a terrible bloke. That people suicided, they lost their, lost their pubs, um, and you know there was another side to. Oh, Alan. there is another side to uh, when it's financial. People don't see the damage it does on the other side. Yeah, well, I, I do. I'm sure you do. I, my my dealings with um, financial fraudsters, I've I've always found them quite frustrating um, dealing with them from a detective's point of view mm. because even when they're caught quite often they won't acknowledge it. There's always an excuse. It's always, but you don't understand the funds were meant to be in the account at the time. They've always got an excuse. And I, I find it very unusual when uh, people that commit that high-level financial fraud actually put their hand up and go, yeah, I'm a crook and this is what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, different jobs, same mm. office for you and me. And yeah. I've found that consistently over the years. There's all this obfuscation, denial. Mm. There's always a reason behind it. And there's always casualties. And one of the things I've written about in uh, Shrink in the Clink is uh, psychopaths, and I've addressed some of that to mm. corporate psychopaths. Mm. Um, there's a sort of misconception that the bad guys are rob uh, only people who rob banks, yeah. uh, whereas I've seen it in uh, you know business over decades. They don't always get charged with things, but they destroy lives legally. Mm. And then you've got the high-profile people who steal from shareholders yeah. and they think nothing about it because all that matters to them is the lifestyle that they're enjoying at that time. Mm. They'll sort it out later. But when they don't, there's big casualties. How did it, um, before we move past Alan, how, how did it uh, affect him going to jail from having the, at the heights <coughs> to uh, the lows of uh, being a prisoner? Um, I think for a while it broke him. Yeah. And... Um, but he said, when I get out, I'm going to do these things. And uh, these markets are ones to watch. And he was still thinking so about the future. The ball and, the future. Yeah. and you know what? They all came off. He came out and he kicked goals again. Yeah. And he died. The, the heart issue I raised, mm. um, ironically, was what killed him 20 years on. And the story behind that, and it's he's deceased, and it's a matter yeah. of public record, he, uh, he had a, um, a pig valve. Yeah. rather than um, a titanium valve. Yeah. Titanium valves, you've got to take blood thinners all your life. You've got yeah. to get the viscosity of the blood right all the time. Pig valve will last, but only for 20 years. So his was starting to fail. Right. He was living in the UK. He came back to Australia to have the operation and never came out of the operation. Right. They couldn't restart his heart. So, um, But he was active again. He was doing things, yeah. very low profile. But he was seeking redemption in his own way too, I think. Okay, okay moving on from Alan Bond, there's another interesting uh, part of your uh, career um, where you were dealing with Alphonse Gangatano and uh, the Melbourne, uh, the wars that were going on in the criminal groups down there. I think um, over a period there was something like 32 people killed over a 16-year um, gap or 16-year period of time. And of those 32, 25 of them were, were my clients. And uh, people had an idea that it was Carl Williams who was behind it. Um, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> someone came to see me for a report and I said, look, I don't want to name anyone, but if you know who's behind this, can you tell them to stop it? He's murdering my cash flow. 
and uh, <laughs> a bit of black psychological humour yeah, there. No, but I, uh, I understand. Uh, it's just it's what this work does to you, basically. Yeah. But it was a it, it was a tragic situation with Alphonse, and it's a good point to start. Well, let, let's talk about him. What what did you know of him? Well, he had a fearsome reputation, handy with his fists, uh, very short tempered, um, and people were very frightened of him in certain situations. I saw another side of him. I was aware of all of that, but I saw a guy who had a partner, uh, two lovely daughters, and I was struck one time. Um, He came to see me at my office. He'd just been released to bail on a murder charge. And um, there were other guys in the waiting room that were going green, you know. (laughs) Oh, they were very worried. And uh, he came in. They said, oh, Mr Gangitano can go ahead of us, no problem at all. Right, so that, yeah. they, they were fellas in the same uh, line of work? Or yeah, same, or in, wanting to be. Oh, okay, on the on You know, the wannabes, <laughs> yeah, the periphery. So they step, there's a pecking order in yes, your waiting ab- room. Absolutely. Um, different pecking order when Alan Bond was there and yeah. I made sure the two were never there at the same yeah. time. But um, he came in and he said, look, I like seeing you, Doc. But do you reckon we could uh, meet downstairs for coffee? Because I'm, I'm not comfortable sitting in a room with all these lunatics, right? Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, so I used to see him over coffee. But at the end of that session, I walked him down to his car. Mm. And he had a BMW uh, and in the back seat were two baby seats. Yeah. Another side of him, you know, a guy yeah, with two so, kids. Yeah. So you're, you're seeing the gangster on one side and there's the father. Absolutely. He liked Oscar Wilde. He would talk about literature. Well read. Well read. And he said, you know, in another life I wouldn't have minded being a, a lawyer. He would have yeah. been a good one. Yeah. Um, but really it wasn't what he wanted to do. He was obsessed with the gangster lifestyle. Um, he used to watch gangster films, Goodfellas, The Godfather, all that sort yeah. of stuff. And there was a strong sense of identification there. Yep. That said, it was an awful crime and, you know, he left behind a widow, two kids without their father and it seemed to be a trigger point for subsequent events which involved, as as we were discussing, um, a lot of people being shot and killed over that period. Yeah. Speaking to them and uh, without naming names but if you, you had that many clients caught up with it, were they the type that wanted to escalate or in their, their quiet moments when they're talking one-on-one with you? Is it a case like I, I don't think anyone really wants to walk around with the threat of death hanging over their head, but they were probably too proud to um, put the brakes on. <clears throat> I agree. I never discussed what was going on yeah. with the gangland shoots. You know, they, yeah. they were there for other reasons because in between all that going on, they were committing serious crimes mm-hmm. and they were on bail and so on. But... Um, Every one of those people had a, another side to them in terms of their story. But, mm. uh, you know, the overarching consideration was what they were doing in the community. And yeah. uh, when you live your life like that, you live and die by the sword, and that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, but people were running a book on who was going to be shot next. You know, mm. it, it became that intense in Melbourne for a while. And, uh, you know, there were people shot in restaurants. The one guy was a hot dog vendor. Uh, shot yeah. in front of his son. Um, Graham Kinneborough was murdered outside of his house and he'd retired effectively. Mm. Um, he was trying to he was trying to slow it all down and got in the way and he was murdered as well. And the, these are, and if the pe- people aren't aware of the specific details, it was played out in the Underbelly series, the first Underbelly series of Melbourne Gangland Wars. I thought it was the best. Um, You know, Vince Colosimo nailed Alphonse's character. Yeah, I I was going to ask you about that. Did he... uh, He did a great job, Vince. He did a great job. He had a swagger about him. Yeah, he did. And um, all the others were very realistic. The storyline was pretty much according to the script, the real-life script. Right. The first one was fantastic. And um, Alphonse, so did he almost accept his fate or did he... uh, did he think he was invincible? I don't think he anticipated being murdered at all. Mm. There's some suggestion that he knew the killer, killers, yeah. and you know they were allowed into his house. He was shot, uh, shot at in the home. laundry, yeah, laundry of his home. I mean, he was very security conscious. Yeah. So someone got under his guard, but who knows who it is? In your role, did you feel um, a sense of? Um intimidation having these type of people as your clients? Was there any uh, fear from your point of view? 
not then. Uh, you know, I yeah. was younger and no, I had my own sense of invincibility. Yeah. Uh, you know, in my 60s now, I look back at it and, uh, you know, I would feel quite vulnerable at times yeah. because I've had another 30 years to see what people are capable of doing and to understand their psychology much better. Yeah. Did it have an effect on you with dealing with all those clients while that was going on? Uh, unquestionably it did. Yeah. And uh, I sort of drifted into depression and anxiety. I had features of post-traumatic stress. Um, I was also living the high life and, you know, uh, at one point I made a silly decision to try some cocaine at a lunch right. and uh, it took a hold of me. It, it was something that um, took the blues away, it gave me energy and, you know, the dangerous thing about stimulant drugs like coke, it adds to your sense of invincibility. Right. Uh, so there was a lot of hubris in my life back then. So with all that, there was a cocktail of um, it was almost inevitable that... Uh, <clears throat> there could be a downfall? I think it was inevitable that something would happen. Mm. You know, I was drinking too much. Yep. Uh, I wasn't paying attention to my professional obligations in the way that I should have. Um, I was working 100 hours a week, way too many hours really. Mm. I don't work anything like that anymore. And, you know, your judgment and attendant to that, your capacity to find boundaries becomes blurred. Right. And that's what happened with me. And so... With all those ingredients, inevitably it was going to be a train wreck that, uh, and one that exploded on the public mm. sort of uh, back in the late 90s. Just, uh, and we'll talk about that, but just talking about your, your foray into uh, taking drugs and that, mm. um, I know in, uh, in your book you mentioned the fact that you thought you could rise above it. You understood the psychology behind the, you know, an addict, and you thought that uh, you could, uh, you could uh, fight it. <laughs> Is that, uh... that that's classic denial, as we yeah. describe it? You know, yeah. you dissociate from what you're doing. Uh, you... Other people get addicted, but I'm I'm too clever and too yeah. smart. I and, won't. And people would pull me up, both in you, and they say, yeah. "Look, you, you got to stop it." And I'd yeah. say, "There's nothing wrong with me." You know, I was yeah. like the Black Knight and the Holy Grail. I just kept on punching, and uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you reach a point where you need coke just to kind of feel normal. Yeah, yeah. And by then you were long gone and I was. And and you were spending uh, a, a large amount of money on it, so it, it's, it's having an impact on you financially? It, it escalated, yeah. you know. I mean, it, it's, it's like cooking frogs, Gary. You put a frog in a vat of water, it doesn't think it's about to be cooked and they turn the temperature up gradually and it's cooked. Using drugs is a bit like that. I mean, if I'd known where that first line of cocaine was going to end up, yeah. there's no way I right. would have done it. But I thought I could handle it. And so, you know, with the passage of time, you become desensitised, you need more, and before you know it, you've got a habit yeah. and uh, you've lost all insight and that, that's how it works, not just with me. Anyone yeah. who's fallen into that trap will tell you the same. And so your downfall, how did that happen? Uh, one of the guys that was supplying me drugs was arrested. He was a lawyer and um, I was caught up in that. Uh, I made the decision just to, you know, this was the make or break time for me. Mm. So, you know, I made full admissions about what had been going on in my life because I thought you, you can't tell half-truths. So and, and getting down the nitty-gritty of it, that's going into a police station, talking to the police? and Absolutely. I, I was interviewed. Um, it went to court. I received a good behaviour bond, no conviction. Yeah. The magistrate said he didn't want to interfere with a significant career yeah. and I thought that was the end of it. And by then I'd been, you know, detoxified and clear of cocaine for a few months back in ninety nine. Uh, then I received a letter from the former Victorian Psychologist Registration Board. Yep. They wanted to talk to me about it. Long story short, six months later, I was struck off the register. Right. And um, that continued for... And, and so people can understand, you can't practice if you're off the register. No, no, I couldn't, couldn't yep. work in psychology at all. Uh, in that period, David Syme, my business partner, died suddenly from a heart attack. Yeah. Three weeks before that, my former wife yeah. had died from cancer and she'd been ill for a year in the lead up to her death mm. and I was going to the hospital every day uh, with our two young children. Yeah. Um, and I was really 
knackered, exhausted emotionally, and then I got charged and I went to court. But I thought, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's been dealt with in court. People can see it for what it is. I was getting treatment for my depression and so on. On that court too, it was very public. Uh, It was front page news everywhere, absolutely. What sort of effect? You you sat in the position of, um, I won't say power, but well respected within the community. Then you find yourself on the front page as uh, someone that's uh, got a raging cocaine habit. It was an extraordinary public fall from grace. Yeah. And uh, I remember coming out of the court and uh, you know what it's like. The reporters are there three deep on the pavement. Mm. Um, I just said, look, I'm grateful to get a bond and uh, don't take drugs. There's no glamour in this. If you think there is, look at me. Uh, And I went off with my tail between my legs, basically. And, of course, I had to deal with kids who were distressed, in grief. Mm. Uh, You know, my my partner at the time, um, very strong. She was supportive. But, you know, our lifestyle changed dramatically. I went from making a lot of money Mm. to earning nothing. Yeah. With five kids to support uh, because by then I'd had more children. And uh, the youngest was born. Uh, he was he was only about a year old, you know, so we're supporting him as well. So that would have had, had – you, you've gone – your status within the community is taken away. Um, yeah. Your financial um, stability is taken away and the lifestyle that you were living. In fact, my youngest was three months old. I'm confusing my years. So we're dealing with a new baby in the house, um, dealing with a loss of status and income. Yeah, Yeah, it was very hard. But if that's not a wake-up call, nothing was ever going to be a wake-up call. And uh, people say you had a choice, you could have just wallowed in it, but I was never going to do that. It's not Mm. in my personality to do that. I recognised my wrongdoing. Yeah. Um, I apologise for it and I resolved to turn my life around and get back. And it was a long process but I, I think I'm back. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, I certainly uh, think you're back but uh, that process for when you got deregistered, so that was after the court matter as well. So Six you, months later. So that's a, that's another kick that you uh, wouldn't have expected. It was always possi- a possibility but uh, you were getting on with things. Oh, look. By the time I was deregistered, I'd been drug-free for nine months. Yeah. My practice was recovering because yeah. people could see that I was recovering and yeah. I still had a bit of respect uh, in the in the community. But I knew it was going to be hard and I didn't delude myself. I knew that I was going to be punished yeah. um, for my behaviour because I think when you're a, a high-profile whatever you do, yeah. um, you're seen as a role model and consequently the lumps they dish out are all the harsher. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I accepted that, uh, difficult as it was. I couldn't argue mm. with it. Um, I ended up finding work. Uh, I was offered a position at Bond University as an adjunct visiting professor. Right. I did that for a while. Um, I started writing a book, but I didn't. Uh, it wasn't published. And it was a long time after that that I then wrote my first book about those experiences right. with the wisdom of hindsight and the maturity yeah. all those years on. But it was a cataclysmic event in my life yeah, most definitely. and a cataclysmic event in the lives that I love most. And uh, mm. I, you know, feel deep regret for what I did to them at that yeah. time, seriously. Getting that type of insight, but when you're looking back now and uh, I, I see someone that's very um, comfortable with who you are, And so do you look back there and think, well, I had to have that experience to become the person I am now? I think I could have done it differently. But I would have been a different person to answer the question. Uh, I think what it taught me was a number of things, that I'm not invincible, I'm vulnerable, I'm human. Um, We all have a break point. Uh, I learnt great humility and uh, I say in one of the books, for those of you with an ego, keep it in the box. I mean, yeah. the, the things that I've learnt out of this, the value of relationships, family yeah. and love and respect for others. And, look, they were always intrinsic to my personality, but they're at the front of it now. Mm. You know, there's no nonsense in terms of the way that I deal with people. And it's a better life. Although it was a harder life to get to this point, yeah. I'm sure my life is much better. And I, I know this for sure, If if that cocaine problem had not been so glaringly exposed yeah. and if the punishment hadn't been so intensive in terms yeah. of losing my livelihood and my reputation, if I'd kept on that trajectory, I could have died within two to three years, you yeah. know, because that's what happens. 
you know, that's the reality. Pe- people of abuse it. drugs, inevitably their health fails. Yeah. And they either have strokes or heart attacks, their livers give way. Uh, my health's pretty good, so I'm well, happy for it. Well, it was something that literally stripped you bare, but uh, you've come, come through it. and uh, Yeah, built again, rebuilt. Yeah. Better programming, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, my life's better. Um, you know, I've been working back in Sydney for about 16, 17 years. I have a practice in Melbourne. I've written a couple of books. My media engagements have been resurrected because yep. I had a lot of media stuff back in the 90s. And uh, I've got balance in my life now. And you're back practising? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I got so, back on yeah, the books. How, and how long did that take you? To... It was near enough to um, three and a half, four years. It mm. was June 2000. Um, I was told in November 2003 that I'd get my certificate back subject to certain prerequisites, which I understood. You know, I had yeah. to have supervision for a couple yeah. of years and uh, I think it was accepted that I'd abandoned my nefarious ways, but I was happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so in about February 2004, I was able to open the doors again. Yeah. And that's how I came to be back in Sydney because I was working in Melbourne but there was still a bit of a stench around it and uh, I came up here. Uh, a number of people supported me. Chris Murphy was amazing. Yeah, it was high-profile. High uh, yeah, um, I bumped into Chris and he said, I've got a couple of cases for yeah. you if you're interesting, interested. They were um, terrorist cases. Yeah. And uh, so it got me back in the game and uh, he was fantastic to me, yeah. Murphy. Uh, he offered me accommodation in Sydney if I needed it because yeah. we'd taken a big financial hit and I needed to get traction going. And there were a lot of others. There's too many to name, but people were incredibly it's supportive. In, it's interesting. Then you hear people say it and say it so many times in times of adversity, you see who your true friends are and mm. the people that you can rely on. And yeah. your experience certainly would have brought those people people out. Yeah. And I, I would imagine in your line of work, it, it gives you an empathy is such a big thing that has to come into play. But it would have to uh, help you in dealing with people now. That uh, if some, if I was sitting here, if you were treating me, I'm thinking, well, you've you've been through that. Uh, you're talking with experience. It's made me a better practitioner for yeah. sure, and uh, it's interesting. I mean, with with the internet now, everybody gets googled, yeah. and I was quite anxious, you know, when I got back into business, gee, 17 years ago, nearly. That you can't I'd, hide anything. Yeah, I'd win the battle and lose the war. Yeah. You know, here's your ticket, but no one would send me any yeah. work. But a lot of the people that I was seeing then and subsequently said, look, you know, I'm very comfortable in talking to you. I can see what you've been through. Yeah. And you understand it in a way that other people don't because you've had that experience. Mm. So it's not just being a practising psychologist with a lot of experience and wisdom, but it's the additional wisdom born of adversity yeah. and understanding the criminal justice system and addiction and all those sorts of things. Mm. And uh, so that's a gift, really. It's a gift to them yeah. and it's it's made me, I think, a better practitioner and uh, a more humble one, less <laughs> less hubris. Yeah, well, it's not a bad trait to uh, have. Um, with your work up here in New South Wales, there's uh, one uh, one person I know that you've had as a client that's uh, he's deceased now, very high profile, Mick Howie. Yeah. Um, uh, the bikey world. And uh, I know you've had a, a lot of uh, clients within that uh, world, but I'm interested in Mick Howie because um, my dealings with Mick Howie are, are at one stage uh, – the team I was working with, we charged him for a shooting offence. He, he got off that. Um, and then there was the uh, airport um, incident. Mm. I was on call at the gang squad when uh, the, the fight between the Comancheros... What and an extraordinary held. event that was. So that, that was extraordinary. And there'd actually been seven houses shot up the night before. There was a lot of stuff going on between the between the bikies. But I also know people in other areas of my life that uh, knew Mick Howie as a friend and... Mm. Uh, they they liked him and he was charismatic and a good family man and a person I respected uh, when talking about Mick Howie said mm. uh, that uh, he really likes him. He's a, he's a decent person. I said, well, shit, mate, uh, what I see is a, a different side of him. There's always a flip side. Yeah. What, what do you know about Mick Howie? Well, look, I was uh, retained again by his lawyers to, yeah. to do a report on him. Uh, I saw was him out at Was this when he was charged with the airport murder? Yeah, yep. it was subsequent to okay. in yep. the lead up to the appeal, okay. as I recall. Yep. So I saw him at Silverwater. Um, I found him very respectful. He was a, a, an easy guy to talk to. 
Um, he obviously loved the lifestyle and he announced with some pride that he was the youngest ever president of the Common Chair He's 23 or 24 yeah, or something. Very young. It, it was ridiculous. So it was seen as a career, Yeah, uh, as it is for a lot of these people. I mean, I've assessed mm. people from, you know, the Commos, the Hells Angels, the Finks, the Gypsy Jokers, mm. um, and they see it as a career and so their behaviour is attendant to their commitment to the cause and um, it's very bad behaviour. You know, yeah. nobody endorses it at all. With um, uh, in regards to uh, Mick Howie, he's, he's an interesting character, and he seems to polarise people. And in, in the, your dealings with him, and can you understand why people gravitate towards him? Um, and also that there's uh, the other side of uh, Mick Howie that uh, people fear. Um, as you said, he's highly charismatic, or he was. Yeah, highly intelligent. Um, he commanded loyalty, and I think people were willing to follow him. Uh, although not within the club, clearly. There are other people yeah. who coveted his position. Um, I found him easy to deal with and um, he was struggling in jail. I mean, this was a rude awakening for him. Mm. And at that time he'd gone down, I think it was for murder or manslaughter. Yeah. And uh, so he was looking at a lot of jail time. He was a family man too. And, you know, what happened to him was just an outrageous crime. Mm. You know, murdered in a car park at Rockdale. Yeah, yeah. Leaving a widow and kids behind. Uh, nobody can endorse that sort of behaviour. But mm. it goes with the territory. So people, when they join up, they know that these sorts of things are there. You know, you're dealing with crocodiles. Yeah. I think it was Kerry Packer who said, if you wrestle grillers, you'll get hurt. Same. Uh, Do you think the <coughs> uh, the experience at the airport, because that seemed to to me, and uh, as I said, I was on call when it uh, when it happened, and then knowing the details of it, it seemed to be something that just escalated out of control, and it was almost like, yeah, two egos, as in the two groups fighting, and it escalated to that. Do you, did you get a sense that Mick Howie, because you were speaking to him when he was actually inside for that, yeah. had regrets about that because that that changed the landscape of bikies. In the country, uh, because it was as a direct result of what happened at the airport that uh, Strike Force Raptor uh, came into play. Yeah. I was at Gang Squad at the time, and I know from from that moment on, the world was never going to be the same for bikies. Do you think he bore some of the guilt with that, being the president? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I think there were regrets, particularly because he was in jail and he'd been found guilty of a serious yeah, crime. Yeah, yeah. It's always hard to disentangle remorse yeah. in that context. But, you know, without making light of it, it was a terrible ticketing error mm. to have the common chairos and the Hells Angels on the one plane together. Yeah. You know, yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but it is what it was. Mm. And... Uh, it was almost inevitable that there was going to be a flashpoint in the terminal. Right. Um, but the evidence was that he didn't swing the bollard. He'd left. Mm. But I think initially he was found guilty because they, it was held that he should have foreseen it and well, he bore the onus of responsibility because of his position in the club. The position he held in there, I think, uh, yeah. I think play, played a part on it. But uh, <clears throat> did he show any remorse that this is a lifestyle he wanted to move away from? Like the risk now became apparent to him that uh, he could spend the rest of his life in, in jail. Did you get a sense of... Uh, I think there were... Could have been a turning point? There are islets of that, little bits of remorse and, mm. you know, he was going to live his life differently. Yeah. Um, I think there was... I didn't have any involvement with him when he was released to the community, but as I understand it... He uh, took on a much lower profile. He was trying to get on with doing other things. Right. But obviously there were tentacles there. Yeah. And uh, I don't agree with what happened to him. I think it's terrible, but he was killed for a reason. Mm. Who knows what the reason yeah. is. Um, I think it's very difficult, generally speaking, uh, for people to extract from this sort of lifestyle once they're immersed in it. Yeah. Plenty of money, plenty of entertainment, women... Yeah. Um, and there's an aura, a misguided aura in my view, surrounding people who are part of bikey clubs and there's a fear. Mm. So uh, all of that stuff, it's a bit like the mafia, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, similar dynamics where there's lines of command, there's capos. Yeah. You do as you're told or you get killed. Yeah. And I think it's very difficult to extract from that. What um, skill set do you think Mick Howie bought or what personality trait to be the president of such a large... Uh Outlaw Motorcycle Club at such an early age. How, how do you think he rose up so quickly? 
I think he was very dynamic and he was charismatic and I don't know beyond saying he must have given them a vision that mm. they could relate to as leaders do, yeah. whether it's for good or evil. Yeah. Um, they give people a vision, a sense of purpose and a sense of the future and obviously it's um, laced with money. Yeah. You know, there's, there's positive return on investment for your time in the club. I'd imagine all of those dynamics were at play. Came into play. Okay. Um, the, with the bikies, I find it, uh, find it interesting that uh, part of the attraction to the bikies is we're outlaws, we're rebels, we don't, um, you know, we don't abide by rules. But a lot of the clubs have very strict, stringent rules. They do. That their members and have to abide by. How, uh, uh, I'm conflicted by that. Like, what are they? Are they outlaws that live outside the rules, but then they look for an organisation that's uh, more <coughs> restrictive than most organisations? It's a fascinating paradox, and you've yeah. articulated it very well with respect. Um, I mean, the bikies started off, they were ex-military guys in the US, yeah. and so... They like structure, they like rules, you know, there's a chain of command yep. uh, and within the the confines of that organisation you follow the rules and if you break the rules, you know, hell will pay, literally, you'll die mm. or you'll be beaten to a pulp. But beyond the strictures of the club, uh, everything's off, you know, you know, anything goes really. Yeah. And so they shoot other club members, uh, they blow up houses, um, you know, they're involved in organised crime at a level that's quite staggering, mm. as you know. But when I've dealt with these people on a one-to-one -one basis, I've always found them to be very respectful. And uh, it is an interesting paradox, uh, particularly the one you talk about where there's anarchy on the streets, yeah. but there's a line of command and there's consequences for breaches within the confines of the club. Yeah. Interesting one to understand. Very, very strict discipline. I think these guys join because they actually want that esprit de corps. They want to feel part of something. And, uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of guys who have tried to get out as well and yeah. they pay a price for it. Mm. They realise the fantasy is nothing like the reality. Yeah. And yeah. they're very disappointed. But then it becomes very dangerous for them. But they do feel, and I do understand that, and the, the uh, ones that I've dealt with, they need that feeling of belonging. They need that. Uh, mm. It's almost uh, uh, to me, and I, I'm not saying this. Or I'm not worried about um, saying it as as a negative. But it's also most like they haven't grown out of school. They need to be part of a group, and uh, yeah. they, they've, they've got their rules and structure. They're not alone. I mean, people join organisations for life. Company true, men, true. you know, they want that strong sense of identification yeah. with the culture. And when they're fired or lose their job, their world falls apart because yeah. they've invested too heavily in that part of their identity. But uh, it's different rules when you're part of a barky club for sure. Getting towards the end, I, I just want to get your views on uh, on drugs and the yep. part that they play in uh, in the criminal world, and in particular ice and uh, the, the drug trade in ice. And uh, I've seen the effects in some rural towns and the results of you know, uh, uh, mayhem. Um, what's your take on that? I agree. It's absolute mayhem. It's out of control. It's by far and away the most diabolical drug ever, in my view, because of its power uh, to addict people early on. And, you know, I've assessed thousands of ice addicts since it's hit the street and uh, they all say the one thing, it gives them energy, it drives their libido and inevitably they lose their judgement. Mm. It's cheap. It's it's cheaper to buy a point of ice than to go and have a round of beers at the at the pub. And uh, there's some research that suggests that there's subtle brain chemistry changes even after one or two pipes. Mm. So even before you know it, your brain is changing along a pathway to addiction. Right. And uh, the consequences are terrible. Uh, we spoke about it earlier that kids back in the 70s were stealing cars. I'm seeing late teenagers now charged with homicide armed robberies, random violence in the street, lots of paranoia, psychosis. You know, the symptoms of somebody experiencing a drug psychosis are not distinguishable really from paranoid schizophrenia. Mm. So they're highly anxious, they, they feel they're under danger, people are following them, and so they'll, they'll react to that. It's an evil drug. Mm. And, of course, the financial toll, families blow apart, no money, they drift into crime in inevitably, not always, but pretty much inevitably. And uh, it's a long road back 
I mean, you can treat heroin addiction, I think, easier than you can treat an ice addiction yeah. because it's so pleasurable for these people. People who use heroin just fall asleep. Yeah, you know yeah. that's what happens. Well, that's 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 the difference. How do we fight it? I think uh, it's happening. There must be a much better coordinated uh, response in terms of penalties for the people at the top of the mm. tree. The importation, life sentences. Yeah. Um, there's got to be better facilities for treatment of the end of the chain users. Mm. Uh, this is not self-interest, you know. I wasn't convicted, you know. My good behaviour yeah. bond expired, you know, a long, long time ago. Yeah. But I, I think anyone who's an addict should be given a chance and they should be put into treatment if they grab the ball and run with it. At some point that should be expunged and get so, them into treatment. So we need to treat addicts. We need to deal with the suppliers more heavily. Yeah. Just just one other point, Um we get back to education in primary schools mm. and high schools. I mentioned earlier beyond the three R's, there should be anger management, social skills, training, those sorts of things. There should also be drug education programs, particularly in high schools, yeah. even primary schools. I mean, I saw a guy, a kid, uh, a year or so ago. He was 12 when he was introduced to us. He was still in primary school. Uh, diabolical stuff, but I think people need to be aware of the dangers of using drugs like this. So they they make better decisions, better informed decisions mm. when it's first offered to them. I, I like what you're talking there, introducing this in the early education. Mm. Um, uh, that's when you can make make the difference. And uh, yeah, we 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 need to be more psychologically minded in tackling this problem. Yeah, that you know the lock them up and punish them model has clearly failed. You know the war on drugs has failed. And in places like Portugal and other parts of Europe where they have decriminalised possession, mm. they're shutting down jails, people getting into treatment, and the money that's saved on incarcerating people is being put into mental health. It's going to take a while to turn the Titanic around, but I think it's achievable. We've just got to get out of this punitive mindset, mm. um, which really was born of politics out of the Nixon era in the US, you know, where they, the war on drugs came out of Nixon. And it was a strategy, some would say, was to lock up black people to disenfranchise them so they couldn't vote. Yeah. And uh, it's clearly failed. <laughs> well, you look, uh, at, look at the figures. I yeah. mean, they, they measure effluent beyond looking for COVID these days, effluent yeah. in the eastern suburbs. You know, there's more coke going out into cocaine. Malabar. Yeah, and, and I, it's unbelievable. And um, it, it has failed and we've got to change our thinking on it. And uh, maybe, maybe what you're suggesting is a is a way forward. Yeah, look, I don't think it's an original thought. A lot of people no, have been, no. been sort of suggesting this for a long time. But my question is how far down the sewer have we got to get yeah. before we sort of sit up and say, well, it ain't working. I mean, it's the it's mark of idiocy to keep doing the same thing and getting the same results if it's not working. Yeah, that's a fair way of putting it, fair mm. way of putting it. All right, well, look. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of this chat, but I'm not... Oh, I'm sad to hear that. I've enjoyed this. <laughs> I'm not promising that you won't be back on this yeah. with an invite. You oh, have be, to accept. I oh, absolutely accept but, it. Thank um, you. I've read your books and I, I, I want to uh, just briefly talk, very briefly talk on your book about um, uh, a shrink in the clink and uh, dancing with demons. Did you find that therapeutic, writing those books? I did. Yeah. And I mentioned earlier that I, when I was struck off, I started writing a book. Uh, it was uh, the title was "Pigs at the Trough," <laughs> and Bill Leake, may he rest in peace, did the cover. Yeah, and it had pigs with dollar bills up their nose, and big vats and flower bags full of cocaine. Now, a strategic decision was made not to put it out there, and right. I think it was a wise decision because uh, I was still kind of takes a while to get over drug use, you know, yeah. and uh, the literature says two years. I reckon it's closer to five before it's clearly out yeah. of your system in terms of your thinking. Uh, so that book wasn't – it was published but never released. Yeah. And then um, I did a deal with Pan Macmillan, great yep. publishing house, by the way, yeah. and uh, Angus Fontaine was my publisher, fantastic bloke. And he said, look, I think you should write about this. And I said, I'm ready to do it. So this was sort of late 2016. And it was published in June 2017. Yeah. And I found it positively cathartic to get it all out. 
with the wisdom of hindsight, obviously greater maturation. I mean, I was 46 when I struck off. I'm in my mm. mid to late 60s now, so yeah. I could look at it with a different pair of eyes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's pretty brutal, but there's no, there's no punches that are pulled and it's an honest account of my life. And I found that uh, quite therapeutic for me to do that. Uh, the second book was published uh, a couple of years ago now, A Shrink in the Clink, and that wasn't about me so much in terms of putting the microscope on my life, mm. but looking at the types of cases I've dealt with over 40 years. So it's all in there, homicides, hit men sexual paraphiles, perverts, drug use, the barky wars, it's all there. And that too was cathartic in a way. Mm. Um, it's good to write about these things. And I think if you have this knowledge, it's a good thing to be able to share it with others. Mm. And, you know, I have students writing to me from all over the country wanting help with their projects, uh, their papers at university because... You know, you learn so much at university and a lot of it's academic and there's obviously a, it's very important that people do that. But I think what people also want is the underbelly. Yeah. They want the dark side. What's it like to actually work as a criminal psychologist? You know, what do you do? How does it affect you? Those sorts of things I think are important to talk about. Well, Tim, having read both the books and then sitting here uh, talking to you, they are a reflection of who you are. So thank what's, you very much. What, what's well, in the book is what we're getting here. So, oh, thanks. Well, um, I, I take that as a compliment. It is a, is a compliment. Mm. It is a compliment. It's been uh, been very entertaining. So, um, at this stage, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. But uh, what I've enjoyed about our chat today is your ability to explain, in layman's terms, the very complex and confronting mind of the criminal. It's been fascinating. I also like the genuine empathy and understanding you have for others that have found themselves on the wrong side of the law. It's a tough gig that you've chosen for yourself, but I think the criminal justice system is a better place because of the work that people like yourself have done. And I think I might get you back on the I Catch Killers because you've got plenty of stories. Uh, it'd be an absolute pleasure to come back. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Cheers. This podcast series is brought to you by True Crime Australia. Visit iCatchKillers.com.au for additional materials such as articles on what you heard, videos and galleries. You can search for the iCatch Killers with Gary Jubelin official group on Facebook and join in with discussion. See you for the next episode of the podcast. <laughs>